Hello, world at I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality of the best hair, and welcome back to the summer of Halloween. <sighs> Continuing to look at the franchise in chronological order, today we're going to be looking at Halloween 2 from 1981. After the original movie did so well, it spawned so many imitators to fuel an entire subgenre of horror. Considering Halloween was seen as the OG, naturally, John Carpenter was offered quite a bit of money to produce a sequel. And also, according to Mr. Carpenter, he wasn't exactly paid well for the smash hit of Halloween, so he saw this as sort of a way to actually get properly compensated for his role in creating a classic. However, he also seemed to feel that in three years, audiences were less interested in the slow burn style the original went for, and instead opted for a story with an emphasis on blood, boobies, and the body count rising. Plot-wise, the movie follows Laurie Strode as Michael Myers continues to try to kill her. Because reasons. They do actually get into those reasons, but, uh, yeah, well, let's take a look at Halloween 2 and see just what this change of direction meant for the franchise. Mr. Simon. As well as a bit of a change of pace for the theme song, I guess. Either way, the story opens up just about where the story ended last time, complete with Laurie, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, telling the kids to go call the police. And under the assumption that Michael is dead, the kids scream like nuts running down the street anyway, getting the attention of Dr. Loomis, played by Donald Pleasance, who comes in to shoot the psychopath down. I would ask why he tried to shoot after he fell, but then again, he just fired seven shots out of a Smith & Wesson Model 15. That's only got a six-round cylinder. I'd see if it could keep working, too. And, of course, just like last time, Michael is already gone. Hell, <laughs> oh, this one didn't take long to start looking silly as fuck. No, I guess it's not quite as bad as Michael just laying in the lawn making grass angels. With all the commotion, the neighbor comes out, and disregards Dr. Loomis's pleas to have the man call the police, because the neighbor's a side character and they're never useful. Is this some kind of joke? I've been trick-or-treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. Uh, well, uh, that's pretty common knowledge there. <laughs> Whoa, sounds like Halloween got a dance remix. It took Friday the 13th three movies before they did that. This leads to the opening credits, of course. Hey, Donald Pleasant's in Jamie Lee... I'm not sure I'm allowed to show that. Either way, the jack-o'-lantern returns, but this one has a prize inside. Oh, hell, I gotta do this. After our little slasher villain dance party, we see Myers, now played by the best name in movie history, Dick Warlock, has escaped into the alleyways, while Loomis follows close behind. But fortunately for Mike, the guy's distracted when the sheriff pulls up, and he has to fill him in on the event so far. I shot him six times! Seven. Unless something missed, I suppose. I shot him six times! I, I shot him in the heart! I they never do actually explain why Michael is able to get shot six times and just survive like he's 50 cent. And then again, they never really talk about it that much anyway. At least in The Terminator, the police, while not knowing he was a Terminator from the future, just kind of assumed maybe the guy's wearing Kevlar. Can't have gotten very far. Come on. I shot him six times! Right. Uh, just so you know, I did not copy-paste that audio. That was in the movie. Those gunshot wounds might mean Michael's bleeding all over everything, but that doesn't stop him from slowly slinking up on unsuspecting senior citizens. It appears that the murders took place sometime early this evening. Authorities have confirmed that all three of the victims are teenagers, two girls and a boy. See, that's why I watch my horror movies with my back up against a wall. I don't have to worry about surprise attacks from the Kool-Aid man. However, Michael was only here for the cutlery and leaves the woman, so she may be terrified at the mess of blood he left in her home. This screaming manages to get the attention of her neighbor, Alice, played by Ann Bruner. Mrs. Elrod? Mr. Elrod? Hey, uh, creepy motherfucker hiding in the bushes? Did you hear something just now? Actually, she doesn't notice him. Good, because that makes the idea of him stalking around far scarier. However, when Alice goes back inside, she hears about how there's a crazed lunatic on the loose, and the police have confirmed he has already killed at least three. Not only that, 
but she just realized her door is open. And unfortunately for her, he was hiding just out of frame. Alice might be dead, but lest we forget, Laurie is still alive. Also, it just so happens the paramedics responsible for taking her to the local hospital are also important characters. Jimmy, played by Lance Guest, and Bud, played by Lo Rossi. I want him to go to sleep. It's alright, take it easy, we're gonna go to the clinic, alright? Don't let him go to sleep. Hey, if you manage to stay awake through the first movie, you'll be fine. It's been two minutes since we've seen flowing blood, though, so let's see a random mother heading to the hospital as well with her son, who was harmed by sabotaged Halloween candy. Here, just, just, just put it up there real gently. You okay? Let's go. Just walk real slow. Come on. And while the general myth of Sabotage Halloween candy is a, a myth, uh, doing a little more research into it is the fact that the guy who in 1974 murdered his son with a cyanide-laced pixie stick, he did also pass out poison pixie sticks to other random kids in the hopes of covering up the crime. It's just luck more than anything that no one else was harmed. Also, all that pleading Laura did not to be put to sleep, well, fuck all those concerns. So soon as Dr. Mixter shows up, played by Ford Rainey, they shoot her up with some shit to help her relax. Also, give a nice close-up on that needle action, just for all you needle fans out there. Ah, well, Dr. Loomis is still on the case, joined by Sheriff Brackett, still played by Charles Cyphers. While the escaped madman proved Loomis's warnings about an escaped madman right, now the cop is just annoyed he let the man escape even though he didn't actually do that, but what's this? Loomis spots someone who looks like a cheap asylum knockoff of Michael Myers, but damn it, Brackett insists on letting the man escape! No! Okay! When the fuck did this suddenly change to Final Destination? Is it him? Is it him or not? I don't know, I don't remember him being nearly this hot. On the plus side, Brackett finally gets word that of the various victims of the last movie, his daughter Annie was one of them. Uh, well, I guess that's not really the plus side. Uh, ah, well. Seems the injection didn't knock Laurie out so much as just turn her into a groggy mess who has no idea what's going on. Don't worry, Mrs. Alves, played by Gloria Gifford, fills her in on how she's doing. Cracked a bone. You're lucky it wasn't a break. Okay, so she didn't really break both her legs, but still, good on her for getting up and running while on that fracture, whereas so many other horror movie characters are surprise paraplegics. We also take the time to point out that Jimmy here is actually romantically interested in Laurie. With that box checked for the movie, we head back over to the crime scene, where Brackett has the dreadful task of identifying his daughter, and yeah, she's still played by Nancy Kiss. While he spent most of the night not believing Dr. Lewis's warnings, of course he just straight up blames him for this tragedy. Logic be damned! Damn you. Sorry. What have you done? I haven't done anything. You let him out! I didn't let him out. I, I gave orders for him to be restrained. Now, oh, come on, you can come up with a better defense than that. I didn't let him out. I, I, I shot him six times! Thus, Dr. Loomis will not be getting any more help from that policeman. Rather, he's got a new cop friend to pal around with for the rest of the movie. Gary Hunt, played by Hunter Von Leer. Loomis is not certain the poor bastard they got fucking killed in fire earlier really was Michael, and insists they keep looking for him. However, after a short break for me to point out, holy crap, that's Emery Martin, Dory DeRoe from Sledgehammer, we find out exactly how Michael discovers where Laurie went off to. The teenager was taken across town to Haddonfield Memorial Clinic. <laughs> radio broadcast her position shortly before kicking off that Halloween dance mix. This means when Karen, played by Pamela Susan Shoop, finally drives down there to start her shift. She parks in the visitor space. Mr. Garrett, played by Cliff Emick, lets her in, establishing that he exists. As does another employee at this hospital, Janet, played by Anna Alicia. She's pretty much the demonetization algorithm made flesh. Every other word you say is either hell or shit or damn. Sorry. I guess I just fuck up all the time. I mean, that's not exactly fair. I'm assuming a high degree of accuracy in the algorithm here. Her feelings aren't nearly as important as Michael Myers slinking around the hospital hallways. 
which is also not the most important thing right now. That goes to Jimmy telling Laurie about the man that tried to kill her tonight. It was, in fact, Michael Myers, escaped mental patient and professional sister murderer. That just leaves one question. Why me? Why me? I always figured, fuck it, cause you're there, but suddenly I got this feeling of surprise sister. The paramedic's caring, attentive treatment of the hospital's one and only adult patient is interrupted, though, when he is shooed off by Mrs. Alves. Seems they've had a little trouble trying to get a hold of Laurie's parents to inform them of her condition, but one of those reasons might be because, <laughs> what do you know, the phones are dead all of a sudden. Don't worry, they have, a uh, one security guard, and that's pretty much the same thing as a maintenance guy, right? I'm gonna go check a poll. You wait here and I'll call you. I have to get back on the floor. It'll take me five minutes. But I don't even know how to use this thing. So walkie-talkie. You walk and you talk. Far as I can tell, the pole looks fine, but what's this? Garrett hears strange noises coming from the dumpster. The dumpster. With blood in it! <laughs> God damn! Pussy! That jump scare out of the way, he continues his investigation, discovering some doors were left ajar, leading into some pretty important parts of the hospital. Better call this in. I think somebody broke into the storeroom. Oh, well, that's just fucking great. He didn't even make sure the things were on the same frequency before he went off to play Pacific Bell. Nah, no reason to actually make sure he can contact her. That way, we can watch him continue to search and face the horrors of poorly stored random objects and even worse. Mr. Garrett? Seems Michael already got rid of that knife he stole earlier. And I already did the Hammer Time joke in the Hellraiser review. Where's Loomis during all of this? With the police trying to identify if the poor bastard they got killed was, in fact, Michael Myers. Spoiler alert, it's not. No feelings. He's young, maybe 17, maybe 18. Michael Myers is 21. There's not a huge difference there, Loomis. And personally, I'm more confused as to why adult Myers was referred to as age 23 in the credits. Who then is this crispy civilian? Well, the handy-dandy angry mob outside the Myers house, who seem to think riding against a building is a productive use of their time, also happen to contain a couple friends who can't find their other friend, Ben Tramer, who left their party a bit early. He had this stupid mask on. All right, boys. Seventeen. I'm wearing a mask. And a stupid mask at that. It must be the one who looked like Michael Myers. Well, that is a pretty stupid looking mask, you gotta admit. Ah oh, well, back to the hospital. <laughs> oh, it's just the jump scare alarm again. This leads to the hospital bed and jump scare number two. Yeah, she's supposed to be watching the babies who have done nothing but sleep all this time. I got like one baby over at my fiance's mother's place right now, and let me tell you, that fucker loves waking up and crying. In this movie, though, the babies sleep like babies, and the two employees can sneak over to the handy dandy hospital jacuzzi for some fucking. Or rather, this is the hydrotherapy pool, but uh, come on, it's hot, it's a tub, and they're trying to have sex in it. But there's a problem with this plan. It's too hot in here now, bud. Why don't you go check? It's cold out there. Though, according to some interviews, that uh, water wasn't exactly hot. Or clean. It was very hard for the actors because it was so fucking cold and at least one of them got sick. Great hospital they got here. Bud does get out to check on the water temperature, but is choked to death before he realizes anything. This means that Michael Myers can keep the temperature roasty toasty as he moves in on Karen. I'm sorry. I get mistaken identity, but Bud was just in the jacuzzi with you. Wouldn't the taste of caked on blood and dirt on the man's hand be the first red flag? Now, Bud, don't be that way. No! 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 Well, at least when he tries to straight up murder her, she realizes, hey, this is a little more rough than I like it. With the power of boiling water, Myers burns Karen to death face first. Yeah, he also dunks his hand in with her over and over again, but yeah, they shot him six times, fuck it. Either way, while the body count continues to rise, Loomis and friends continue investigating Myers and find what happened to that knife from earlier. It's 
sister. Hey, more clues about as subtle as playing hot potato with a mini nuke. Sam Hain. Samhain. It means the Lord of the Dead. D darkness. Lord of Darkness. And not darkness like evil, darkness like... It tends to get dark at that time of year. The end of summer. The festival of Samhain. Samhain. This questionable history lesson is interrupted, though, when Marion shows up, again played by Nancy Stevens. She's here to pick Dr. Loomis up and drag his ass back to the sanitarium away from Haddonfield by order of the governor. That'll keep him good and safely out of Meyer's way for a while, but what's this? Myers might not be needed to fuck up Laurie's day, as the medication they gave her might have just left her wide-eyed and unresponsive. So Janet rushes to get Dr. Mixter, who is also somewhat unresponsive. Dr. Mixter? I'm pretty sure he saw that one coming. Of course, only important people are allowed to find bodies and live, and Janet is thus immediately seized by Michael, who injects an air bubble into her brain. Seems he really hates the idea of killing anyone in the same way twice in this movie. So now changes up to this handy-dandy syringe, and moves in to kill Laurie Strode. Of course, she's the one person he's consistently fucked up trying to murder, so why stop now? Indeed, she's out and about limping around in the hospital on her cracked leg. This doesn't mean she's doing okay, mind you. Laurie's still suffering from some side effects of the medication, and groggy as all hell. Don't worry, though. She can find some random side room to have a power nap, and she's perfectly safe. In the meantime, Jill, played by Tawny Moyer, starts to realize, uh, along with Jimmy, that they can't find anyone in this hospital. Like, even more than usual. With that in mind, Jimmy begins searching high and low for any signs of... anybody. He does manage to find Mrs. Alves, tied to a gurney, where it seems Michael found yet another method of murder, draining her blood onto the floor. <laughs> Jill, on the other hand, decided, fuck it, it's time to get out of here. Problem with that plan is not only will the horror movie not allow her car to start, but it seems it was sabotaged as well. Not only that, every single tire of every single vehicle has been slashed. At that point, I'd just start running the fuck away, but she decides to go back inside where she finally locates Laurie. Oh, and one other person. Now, oh, don't look so surprised, Laurie. He pinned Bob to the wall with a kitchen knife in the last movie. It's pretty obvious at this point, physics really don't matter. But now the chase is on. Michael Myers, slowly walking towards Laurie, who is groggy, drugged out of her mind, and running on a cracked bone. However, there's still like 15 minutes of movie left, so when she slowly makes her way to an elevator... <laughs> Michael's nice enough to just... Let her go. I mean, he got his hand in there. The things have safety features. They don't just crush your fingers. They tend to open the fuck back up, but... Eh, I mean, the journey is far more important than the destination. Am I right? Now that Laurie's also made it to the parking lot, and could also try just hoofing it, I mean, she'd definitely do worse than Jill at that, and it's likely that a real psycho killer could very well catch up and kill her no problem in that scenario, but she says fuck it and decides to just hide in the car. Speaking of which, Loomis is in the car with Marion, and just now finds out, hey, he might have been Meyer's doctor all this time, but they kept certain aspects of the case secret, just in case they wanted to fuck with him in a sequel. That girl, that Strode girl, that's Michael Meyer's sister. Surprise! Laurie is Michael's sister. What a revelation. With that one clue that I didn't even show you, where she's just sleeping and has a dream, asking her mother what's wrong, and her mother yells back that she's not really her mother. Yeah, really subtle clues here. And it just makes me wonder now, why all last movie was Michael's motivation to kill Laurie, and instead he just stayed across the street and killed everyone but Laurie? Thus, Loomis knows that Michael must be going to the hospital to finish the job. The driver refuses to turn around, but that's nothing a handy-dandy case of tinnitus can't solve. Also, good news! Jimmy is fine! And just so happens to get in the same car that Laurie's in? No. Fine as in alive, as the man is still not doing particularly good. I think, uh... <laughs> huh? 
I swear, that overnight shift is murder, let me tell you. She stops the honking soon enough that even Loomis and company don't hear it when they roll up. Dr. Loomis also enlists the help of the Marshal, played by John Zenda, at gunpoint, while Laurie tries to get their attention, but for one reason or another just now seems incapable of raising her voice. Help me! Though at that point, they should have still been able to hear her. Might as well have just had her screaming the whole time if these assholes are just going to ignore her. On top of that, Myers shows up, and these assholes somehow manage to lock the fucking door on Laurie. No bother, that just raises the tension for them to get her inside before Michael can harm her. <laughs> Walking through doors well before Jason Voorhees. Also through much more believable material, but we can go to Michael on this one. And Loomis gives Michael five more shots in the chest. This results in him falling again, but Loomis knows better. As he points out, Michael is still breathing. Thus, he sends Marion out to radio for help, leaving us with himself, Laurie, Michael, and Officer Dumbass. Get away from him! But he stopped breathing! No! Look, I know he's been shot and shot and shot again, but the guy's holding his breath. That's gotta count for something. Let me snuggle up next to the body. With only Laurie and Dr. Loomis left in Michael's sights, he closes in. However, Dr. Loomis isn't going down without a fight! <laughs> a prick! My one weakness! With just Laurie and Michael left, Laurie grabs the gun and shoots Michael in the eyes! Interestingly enough, this makes little difference. Bullets to the brain? <laughs> it's the shot eyes that are the real problem, blinding Michael. Also, what do you know, Loomis is still alive! At least for a little while, because they figure the best thing they can do to take care of this Michael Myers problem is fill the room with flammable gases, and Lori runs for her life. It is time, Michael. Ah, the time before CGI effects, where underestimating your pyrotechnics runs the very real risk of killing your actors. Or stunt doubles, depending on the movie's budget. The explosion has managed to, uh, set Michael on fire, but he's good for it. Got that handy-dandy fire suit to take a stroll in, before collapsing and burning to death. For now, anyway. Therefore, happy ending! Pretty much everyone in the hospital died. Spare Laurie, the babies, and Jimmy, maybe? And Laurie rides in an ambulance to a different, better hospital, while Michael roasts away. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Bum, 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 bum. Make him the cutest that I've ever seen. And I still have no fucking idea how the hell that song fits into a Halloween-themed slasher movie. But anyway, that was Halloween 2. And... I did like it better than the first, but that's not to say it doesn't have its own problems. Halloween was very slow and not scary, whereas Halloween 2 picks up the pace quite a bit, but while I felt it could do the stalky suspense better than the original, it gave up on that quite early on. Halloween 2 explores stalker Michael Myers more in the first 20 minutes, and it works pretty well. He sneaks around, you know he's there, the victims don't, and we're not even sure who he is or is not interested in killing, and that keeps things tense. I like this far more than Michael standing there staring at people who stare back in broad daylight while fuck all happens. However, when we get to the hospital, this angle is abandoned pretty quickly. Once we start watching Michael stalk and kill in the hospital, the methodology changes from a hunter to a basic slasher villain. Michael spends far less time stalking his prey and more coming up with new and creative ways to kill people. That does keep the kills interesting, which is important considering this movie's body count is far higher than the first, but there's nothing wrong with sticking with a knife for more than one kill either. Finally, we have that twist you can see miles away. Laurie is, in fact, Michael's little sister. Great. Uh, that means what, exactly? If Michael wanted her dead so bad, he could have tried a little harder to kill in the first movie when all she had for company was a couple of kids, as opposed to wasting the whole night killing random teenagers across the street instead. Anyway, Halloween 2 is a more generic kind of horror movie, but it has its good points. The acting is a step up, the budget is clearly put to good use, and the little amount of stalking we do see is well done. John Carpenter's focus on keeping up with the Joneses for the body count, gore, and titties, though, means the whole thing kinda ends up feeling like just about any other horror movie of the decade, but still comes in at a respectable three horribly killed innocent partygoers out of five. But hey, it does have Michael Myers in it, which is more than can be said for some movies. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, 
There has never been a single recorded instance of a child being killed by a stranger's tampered with Halloween candy. But it still doesn't hurt to check. A horror movie doesn't need a ton of gore or a high body count in order to be scary. I never said that it did. Laurie was helping her father with his realty business, not some random realtor friend. Oh, God damn it! I shot him six times!